session. So uh, we have three talks in this session, and we'll start with the talk from Deepak Jena from Cornell University. He's going to talk about materials and devices for classical versus quantum information systems myths versus reality. Uh, thank you, uh, Jyoti. And uh, uh, I want to especially uh, uh, thank the uh, uh, organizers, you know, Jeremy and uh, Suzanne, uh, and uh, uh, also Kerr for inviting me here uh, for, to, uh, to share some thoughts on uh, 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 some progress in materials and devices, uh, and also to discuss the uh, aspect of uh, uh, quantum information systems some, some angles. Uh, you know, Rolf Landauer, uh, one of the uh, pioneers in uh, electron transport and a lot of ideas of energy and computation at IBM, uh, uh, was in the, in, in the very place where a lot of the ideas of quantum computation was born, you know, DiVincenzo criteria, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he has a very uh, interesting article. Of course, quantum mechanics is useful. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, is it useful to do computation? This is a very interesting article. I highly recommend it. It's in the Proceedings of Royal Society, 95 or 96, something like that. Uh, and the more recent one is a little more pessimistic by uh, Diakonov, uh, who is also another pioneer in spin-based phenomena in, in, in transport. Uh, this is uh, last year in IEEE spectrum. Uh, his uh, arguments are primarily based on technological challenges in storing you know, very, uh, very, very large number of uh, qubit you know, coefficients in, in, in physical systems. Anyway, so th there's something to learn from them, but of course, as a device physicist, we, uh, we are never deterred from uh, you know, pessimism. We, we keep walking away, uh, and I wanted to show where, you know, how, how, how that aspect is moving along now. So uh, let me start with classical computation. Uh, how, what is a typical classical information system? Uh, information system is useless if we only do computation. It's no, of no use, uh, because that comp whatever data you create, must be stored somewhere. There must be memory. And if you store and, and compute uh, and you don't communicate, no, no useful thing either gets done. So communication is an integral part of a classical information system. So the three pillars really are a logic or computation. There's memory and there is communication. If you take out one of these, uh, typically the system is, 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 uh, uh, has as much uh, reduced uh, capacity to, to, to actually perform in useful ways. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, I kind of label this as pre-iPhone pre era. This is how it looked. We had our laptops or we had our desktops. And we would frequently or infrequently send out some emails you know, prior to 2000 or 2007. And uh, now uh, the, data, the classical information system looks very similar. But a lot of the data and computation and memory is not done in front of us. It is done in a cloud. You know, it's done in data banks, which are placed in rivers or lakes near to, to handle cooling and all that sort of thing. So uh, uh, as a result, uh, this computer in front of us is typically getting weaker uh, because most of the work is offloaded to the data center. And the data center and the computer communicate through photons or micro uh, microwave or optical fiber you know, photons. And so the communication bandwidth necessity has gone up a lot. You know, we have 5G coming, there's 6G, et cetera, et cetera. So the data, uh, uh, this is classical data, bits of zeros and ones uh, that are transmitted you know, through uh, air, uh, either with microwaves or, or through optical fibers. Uh, but you know, essentially, the architecture of the whole system is similar, but it's not quite the same because it's distributed. Computing is sort of being done uh, elsewhere. Well, a, a typical connection between the uh, information uh, at uh, you know where where you are uh, using it and where you access where you access it from uh, may look like this. It's just a simple picture. Uh, you you tr you you uh, essentially shake electrons in an antenna or in a you know in a laser and it emits a photon and the photon goes out and uh, as it goes through the atmosphere or an optical fiber uh, you transmit at a frequency and uh, as it uh, goes through transmits to uh, you know, far off distances, there's noise that kicks in, and the signal also decays. Uh, and at, at, the, at the very end, you have to collect it. So as a result, one of the most important things in classical computation is gain. You must have gain. You must be able to regenerate the no signal. Right? 
And I'm trying to say that because, uh, uh, and sort of em I will emphasize that more uh, because this is a very big missing piece in quantum computation. And uh, it is, uh, uh, I think, a big challenge, uh, even conceptually, uh, to think about gain in quantum computation. But uh, classical computation lives, classical communication lives because of gain. We take it out and the whole system collapses. And this is a very important concept, uh, and I also want, wanted to bring it up in the very beginning. Uh, so uh, com uh, let's look at the uh, com computation part first. Uh, uh, in all of these areas, computation, communication, or in memory, uh, what uh, the classical systems have done is, of course, strived. We continually strive and we continue to improve uh, the energy efficiency. So in other words, you want to compute and uh, you put in this many amount of joules and you get this much data computation done, you know, this many additions or matrix multiplications or you know, uh, 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 image recognition. And so so the, you want to consume less energy and you want to do it fast. So you want to be at this end of the spectrum of, of this curve. Right? Uh, of course, the major device that is used today is the transistor, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, on the other end is the communication here, which is uh, you want to uh, communicate more data at high frequencies, and so you want amplifiers that can, you know, throughout, can serve 10,000 cell phone users instead of 100, so you want more energy, but at high frequencies and at high efficiency. That's converting energy from you know, uh, say DC energy to RF energy or oscillating energy or, uh, or wave, for example. Uh, and uh, what uh, in classical computation we are doing, if you're thinking of qubits, of course you have the north and south pole, we have zero and one. Uh, in a qubit you have a superposition, but in classical computation we let all these other sets out. We just use the north and south pole, that's a zero and a one. And we do not use superposition, in fact, we use the tendencies of any system, such as thermodynamics and irreversible processes, uh, decay and decoherence, to our advantage by every time the, the vector moves away from there, it pushes it back there. Right? So that is the idea of gain. And in fact, you are banking on thermodynamics, exclusion principle of electrons, as well as things like stimulated emission or copying a photon and producing another one, exactly the same one again. Uh, to our advantage because all of these things gave us gain in, in, in classical systems. Uh, and uh, I think the challenges uh, in some aspects of quantum are essentially uh, realizing that if you take, if you have one photon, for example, uh, you want to copy it, uh, there's a problem with that. You know, that's a fundamental tenet of quantum mechanics that uh, uh, there's no cloning theorem. You cannot sort of copy arbitrarily. Uh, if you measure a state, it collapses, etc. things like that. Uh, so uh, some, some things one has to sort of uh, fight with. Uh, I will just show a slash, it's no need to read it. Uh, memory technologies in classical systems are somewhat limiting today. Uh, a lot of the memory, 70% of data today is stored in uh, magnetic memories with spins of collective nanomagnets. Uh, and 30% uh, is typically moving into solid state drives, which are semiconductor-based memories there. You use the charge instead of the spin of the electron, just a capacitor. Right? And uh, there are all kinds of memories. Currently, uh, you know, there's uh, 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 NAND flashes are the most popular ones, which enable a lot of handhelds. Most laptops are moving away from magnetic memory. But all the data centers still use heavy amounts of magnetic memory. And, and uh, uh, magnetic memory is, of course, non-volatile. OK, so let me uh, go into a little bit more uh, uh, oriented towards devices. I just want to discuss a little bit about the transistor and start motivating the qubit part. Uh, so the transistor uh, is a semiconductor device where the electron current flows across two terminals, just like the switch on a wall. You switch it, and you connect two wires, and the current flows. Uh, and if you switch it off, the current will stop. And so you can switch it from on to off. The resistance can go from very high to very low. Uh, and uh, so that's an electronic switch. Uh, it's also an amplifier. You can feed in a weak signal into the gate. You know, you can oscillate, oscillatory signal. And what will come out is, an, uh, a, 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 you know, you convert DC energy into gain. You amplify it. So it's, uh, it has this dual purpose. Uh, so if you get gain at high frequencies, you can use it for RF electronics or amplification or communication systems. If you can switch it at high voltages, you can do power electronics, et cetera. Uh, the basic fundamental idea of the transistor is straightforward. Uh, you have a semiconductor. Here's the band edge, uh, the lowest eigenvalue of a conduction band. You have a band gap, and therefore you have electrons distributed in the conduction band that follows a Fermi-Dirac distribution due to the Pauli exclusion principle. And you come in with a gate voltage. You, you have a barrier for electrons to go from here to there, and you sort of electrostatically control that barrier, and you let through the electrons or not. 
And that's your on uh, if you let them through. It's off if you let them, if you cut them off. And since this Fermi Dirac distribution gives you an exponential decay in the distribution of electrons, uh, you can switch it by several orders of magnitude, eight to nine orders of magnitude uh, on to off ratio. So the resistance switching is very high. And that's the basis of all digital classical computation today. You know, so one and a zero. Uh, now, uh, there are a lot of new uh, ideas for transistors to make them even more efficient. So instead of electrons going over the barrier, you can go through it. And that's Zener tunneling, where the wave function of the electron you know, leaks into the other side. And that's a tunneling transistor or a tunnel fed that, that already has experimentally shown to be more, you know, at least able to switch at a lower amount of energy than the classical uh, transistor where you're going over the barrier. I don't know how one should call it a classical because if you did not have the exclusion principle, you will not get this on-off ratio either. So it is already quantum in that sense. But we are not using the coherence of the electrons here. We're just using the exclusion principle. Uh, uh, so if you put them all on a chart and you look at transistors, tunneling transistors, standard CMOS, you know, silicon transistors, et cetera, and look at this energy delay product, uh, we are sitting here today. CMOS high performance is here. CMOS high performance is my laptop. CMOS low voltage, which is my cell phone, which you know, it should last for four days, maybe sometimes half a day. But uh, so low voltage is here. You trade off energy and time. And all these other technologies, be it tunneling transistors or so on, are very close by. They're not too far off. So you typically, to you know, do a 32-bit addition, for example, two 32-bit numbers, you want to add them, get the you know, addition done, you will take about a, you know, 100 picoseconds, and it, you will have to spend about 10 or 20 femtojoules. You know. It's incredibly efficient. You know, it's incredibly efficient. But it's, uh, uh, the question, though, is, uh, uh, is it, uh, how far is it from fundamental limits? So here's uh, another uh, way of looking at this. It's actually similar, but if you look at the KT log two, you know, if you have a binary digit, this is the thermodynamic entropy, if you might. Uh, that's ten, three times 10 to the minus six femtojoules. And we are about six or seven orders higher here, you know, or maybe eight orders higher in all these technologies. If you look at H bar by KT, that's a time scale. And if you think of it as some sort of a quantum time scale, uh, then uh, at room temperature, let's say. Uh, so that thing is about uh, you know, uh, 3.003 uh, picosecond, and we are talking about you know, hundreds of picosecond here. So in other words, there's a lot of room on this side. You know, we, are, we are very far from there right now uh, with, with all the classical computation. Uh, but at the same time, we are spending a lot more energy. In some sense, we are wasting it, right? Uh, but in some other sense, uh, my colleague Sandeep Tiwari says that, no, you're not wasting it, because every system has noise in it, and you have to fight the noise, and the only way to fight the noise is provide more energy, right? You have to rise above the noise. The signal must be recovered. And there's a good article I would suggest if you are interested to read, uh, where it shows that you need you know, at least 15 kT of energy to, to at least fight against all decoherence and noise in the classical computation already. You know? Forget quantum part at this point, just the classical computation. Okay? So how do we fight noise? Uh, again, just abstracting this whole thing out, uh, here's the transistor, you have a barrier, and if you put one transistor and another in a stack, that is the CMOS inverter. Right? So everybody knows, uh, for sure, because of the algorithm, who invented the CMOS inverter. <laughs> okay, so it's by name, and nobody, of course, knows. Uh, surprising. In fact, because of this reason, I, you know, this is a nice article by one of the inventors of these structures, uh, Likarev. Uh, it's a virtually an exact analog of the semiconductor field effect transistor, except it's now going to operate with one quantum of flux, one flux quantum. And, and, and the way it happens is because in a, if you take a Josephson junction, which is two superconductors separated by a very thin insulating layer, then the current that flows through a Josephson junction, uh, to me, I still look at this equation, and it just fascinates me that uh, the current that will flow across you know, any Josephson junction uh, uh, as, is, a, is a function of the voltage. And, and the, uh, this is today the standard of voltage. This is defined as the standard and the NIST standard for voltage, right? The, uh, based on the flux, because the flux is quantized in units of H over 2E. So if I take a voltage pulse across a Josephson junction and I integrate it over that pulse width, I will always get H by 2E, and that's one flux quantum. And, and that is very interesting, because here what you're doing is not doing electronics with a bunch of electrons, a large number of electrons, but one quantum of flux, you know, magnetic flux. 
And uh, the basic idea is very similar, as I mentioned, to the digital electronics. Here, you're, uh, you flow a current through a Josephson junction. If the current is a certain density, then uh, this, this Josephson junction has a little resistive you know, sort of shot called the RSJ, a resistively uh, shunted uh, Josephson junction. Uh, so this loop uh, traps exactly one flux quantum, h by 2e. And if you flow a slightly larger current or different current, then you expel this flux. You know. And that's very simple, zero and one. You know, you've got your digital electronics right there. Uh, the voltage range you get uh, is about a millivolt, and the time you get is uh, about a picosecond. You can play off a little bit of each other, but the product is always h over 2e. So this is the uh, basic unit of, uh, so if you think about it in a transistor, we are doing logic at picosecond time scale, but with one volt. Here we're doing it with one millivolt. Right? So this looks like a much lower energy argument, and it is, in fact, uh, this is an article from uh, two years ago in IEEE Spectrum. Here's the most powerful digital computer today, Tianhe, I mean, one of the supercomputers, uh, sorry, in 2016, uh, and it's based on CMOS. And here is, unfortunately, not data, but this is prediction if you did this with superconductors, you know, with, with completely established, well-established physics, no, no fancy stuff. Fancy thing is in technological and scaling and all that. Uh, you would be you know, dropping it by two orders of magnitude, now, this did not include uh, the, the fact that you have to cool it. You know, I mean, that's, of course, a big you know, uh, elephant in the room, if you might. Uh, but the, the device structure looks, uh, looks like this. You know, there's a niobium electrode, there's a tunnel barrier, and there's a niobium electrode. And the Cooper pairs, which are you know, genuinely real quantum objects, if you might, uh, they are paired electrons. Uh, uh, we, they tunnel uh, collectively through this uh, interface to the other side. That's what gives you this single flux quantum behavior. Here's a full-blown circuit uh, uh, of, uh, called the rapid single flux quantum or RSFQ logic. Uh, so what uh, DARPA and especially IARPA did recently was uh, went back and said that, look, today all the logic, all the, most of the computation is being offloaded to a data center. Right? It's not, I'm not doing it on my computer. So I don't have to carry around that cryostat with me. There's no problem cooling a data center. Absolutely no problem cooling a data center. In fact, it's probably better because uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, handling the heat output, you, you essentially have to, yeah, keeping it cool is actually turns out to be easier. In fact, if you include the cooling costs on the same chart, energy delay product, here's CMOS and here's the superconducting electronics, including the cost of liquid helium. Now that's very interesting to me. So, uh, 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 so this is uh, not quantum computation. This is digital computation, but using superconductors. And to me, uh, this is exciting because it's back in a big way, hopefully. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so, you know, it, it's, uh, the joke always is always remain a technology for the future, but hopefully not. We'll see the superconducting electronics. So, uh, the most advanced form of quantum computation today uses the exact same device, the Josephson junction. In fact, the Josephson junction can come in you know, three recipes or more if you want to think of it. It can be a charge qubit, flux qubit, phase qubit. But they're all the Josephson junction in the end. Right? And the other thing that they use is Josephson junction coupled, uh, Josephson junction, a Cooper pair box if you might, coupled to a microwave transmission line. And guess what's, who are experts in microwaves? Communication people, they have been doing microwaves for a very, very long time, both classically. You can, uh, in, in, the, in the quantum regime now, you have a one qubit here, maybe another qubit there, and you have one microwave photon that has to sort of ring back and forth and entangle the two, right? And the microwave photon, absolutely, you know, this transmission line has to be absolutely lossless. Luckily, it's made of a superconductor, therefore, so you have no loss, right? You have no loss once you're below the critical temperature. Here's a physical qubit, uh, I think, from the Yale group, which is definitely one of the leading groups in the world. Uh, so it's a Cooper pair, Cooper pair with microwave transmission lines that connect uh, these Cooper pairs. What I want to sort of say really is uh, the framework for digital logic is the same. Uh, you know, what you are doing here, you are taking all these energy scales down to a single photon. That's really what you're doing, a single microwave photon. And uh, with that, uh, the big, big challenge people are facing uh, is, is uh, coherence, right? How do you keep this not, you know, if you have your qubit point at some block vector, and it's, you know, instead of evolving unitarily, it will decay and it will die out after a few microseconds. It's a big problem, right? So, and the coherence is tied uh, a lot to material science. Uh, here's an example of a, of a, Joseph, a new kind of Josephson junction. These are made out of two-dimensional materials, layered materials, layered superconductors. 
uh, now uh, this is niobium selenide stacked on top of another niobium selenide, and you start seeing uh, Josephson Junction-like behavior. Uh, here's one where uh, people are, you know, uh, this is group uh, from the uh, Lincoln Labs. They are using graphene as uh, graphene and boron nitride as their you know tunnel junctions for the Josephson Junction. Similar thing, but different uh, new kinds of Josephson Junction. The big problem is to make uh, thing coherent. You need to have few defects, you have to have very good interface control. And uh, if you look at, uh, uh, of course, this is very old data from Bell Labs, actually. Uh, but uh, the, the interfaces in these junctions are good enough for digital logic, uh, but they're not good enough for quantum logic f over a large scale. If you want to have 1,000 qubits, it's a problem. There's decoherence and defects and all these things. You know? uh, I should say that making, making them better will also benefit digital logic as well, because you are taking up a billion transistors, and the best uh, superconducting logic devices are still in the mega, you know, 10 to the power 6, not 10 to the power 9 yet. So being able to make them larger, more uniform is very, very useful. OK, so uh, what uh, I, I told you a lot of general things. Uh, so, uh, so we are investigating a bit of those 2D materials and uh, tunneling in of Cooper pairs across 2D layers and that sort of thing. But I wanted to say a little bit more on not 2D, but uh, more uh, something sort of a hybrid of a communication and uh, a logic system. So here's a picture from my visit with my colleague, uh, Dave Erickson, to the IBM Watson Center. And as you know, they are one of the uh, leading groups in the world making uh, real quantum computers, right, with real qubits. And uh, uh, I know there are some people in the audience here. Randy is an old timer, and, and there are others who are uh, going to tell us a lot more about this tomorrow. Uh, so here's they are one of the early prototypes of the quantum computer. Uh, there are qubits are sitting here. These are banks of Josephson junctions. And uh, on top there of there are uh, RF amplifiers because it needs microwave photons to do the logic between, uh, by, by communicating between qubits. And, and then you have all these wires, uh, or rather waveguides, if you might, that feed those photons in into that, in, into the qubit. Uh, and uh, so this is, of course, a large thing. And then there's cooling. Uh, and uh, when we uh, discuss this matter with some people there, in, in, in addition to a few others, uh, uh, one of the things that really stood out is uh, currently it is possible to make the Josephson Junction with basically the same platform as the RF amplifiers. Uh, there's a huge temperature incompatibility, but material science-wise, there's no incompatibility. And uh, let me just guide you through that. Okay, so we, are, we have been working on uh, RF amplifiers for a very long time, and these are what are in our cell phones, in our you know, uh, aircrafts, all that stuff for communication satellites. Uh, an RF amplifier device looks like that. This is an epitaxially grown material. It's gallium nitride, let's say. You have some interface. It's a transistor, uh, but with a very short gate length, you know, 50, 30 nanometer depends. And with that, uh, you essentially, is, these are engineered uh, down to their you know, quantum conductance level. The contact resistances in these structures where the electrons are flowing from here to there are in the, you know, basically in the Landauer limit, uh, H over Q squared limit. Uh, and uh, when you uh, look at these transistors, they can switch at uh, you know about half a terahertz, you know, 400 to 500 gigahertz. You know. It's no problem. So even at a 100 gigahertz, they can generate milliwatts of power today, and that is really driving uh, the new communication technologies forward. But this is made of gallium nitride, you know. and interestingly, if you look you know into the PR table, here you have niobium, and niobium nitride is one of the most interesting superconductors. You know. And if you look carefully, it turns out that the lattice structure, crystal structure of gallium nitride is very well matched to that of niobium nitride. If you look at the lattice constant of niobium nitride, it falls very close to gallium nitride. So, uh, so in a joint effort with NRL and in our group, we do also molecular beam epitaxy, we started growing these structures. Can we integrate the superconductor with the semiconductor and take advantage of, the, of this joint things that they have to offer? Right? Uh, so this is a niobium nitride layer grown epitaxially with aluminum nitride or with GAN. It indeed is superconducting. Uh, on top of the superconductor, we can continue growing. And as I mentioned earlier, with the semiconductor device, we can make a transistor. So this is a completely epitaxial structure where all these entire layer stacks, there's a quantum well on top, there's a 2D electron gas. The en entire thing is grown by epitaxy. We essentially, it's, it's one crystal. One la some layers of which are superconductors, some layers of which are semiconductor, they're quantum wells, et cetera. Uh, when we grew that, uh, we have a two-dimensional electron gas over there on top. So the first time we start seeing 
magnetotransport oscillations at low temperatures, you know, quanti this standard Shubnikov Dehas oscillation. It's not very remarkable that we have Shubnikov Dehas oscillations in a two deg, but what is remarkable is it's for the first time that have grown epitaxially on top of a superconductor with sort of, uh, you know, less defects than one would have otherwise. Uh, uh, now, what is interesting is this transistor is fully functional. It switches, it has this large on off ratio, okay, uh, and, and it has a good current saturation, but it is also aware that it's sipping, sitting on top of a superconductor. If we measure the transistor carefully at a temperature that is above the superconducting critical temperature, it behaves like a normal transistor, you know, with a metallic load, if you might, at the, at the, at the source end. But if you go below the critical temperature of the superconductor, you start seeing Already in the transistor characteristics, you start seeing negative differential resistance. It's picking up the fact that it's sitting on a superconductor and that it can cause uh, phase transitions in the superconductor itself. Right? So it's sort of a hybrid of the two, a semiconductor and a superconductor. Uh, one of the nice things you can do is, uh, I'll maybe skip over there. Uh, this is the 2D electron gas again that is grown on the superconductor. And we can push it into very clean quantum hall effect. You know, very, very clean and is equal to one quantum hall. These are uh, when the 2D electron gas gets pushed out to the edge of the wafer or edge of the mesa. And these are completely topologically protected. So your RXX is really zero. RXY is exactly you know quantum of conductance. You know, 25.6 over n. N is one, two, three. So you have one edge state, two edge states, and so on. So there are some interesting things one can do by combining superconductor and edge states, topologically protected edge states. That's another whole another game, but uh, uh, I think there's a good platform for trying those things out potentially. We can even push this 2D electron gas into a fractional quantum Hall state, but uh, anyway. So, yeah. so this work sort of appeared earlier this year, and I'm very excited that we can potentially take advantage of these two material families superconductors and semiconductors, because both have something interesting to offer. Semiconductors can bring a lot of gain with them, and, and uh, uh, the superconductor brings the full quantum aspect of it, you know, because the whole wave function of the superconductor is one, it's like one big atom, right? Okay, so I, I know I'm running out of time, so what I'll show uh, a little bit is uh, we are able to inject Cooper pairs into the semiconductor, and they can flow over few, uh, half a micron or so at low temperatures. Uh, but I wanted to end with the communication part because that's, uh, I feel, much more tangible. It's happening today. This is not something we have to wait for very long. Uh, quantum and secure communications using quantum mechanics is happening today. Uh, in what sense? Uh, I'll skip through a few of these which I've already talked about. Uh, uh, I mentioned that the RF electronics or microwave is being uh, uh, used for most communication today, for cell phone communication and mobile communications. Uh, uh, but, uh, and, and the game is always to get high, high voltage or high power at high frequencies, terahertz, 100 gigahertz, and things like that. And this is being powered by materials like gallium arsenide or gallium nitride. These are the semiconductors that power them. Uh, if I look at uh, uh, the, one of the big challenges in quantum communications, let's say you create data. You can create digital data, and you can do quantum transmission. No problem. You can do that. Right? Uh, quantum transmission, uh, but that needs a conversion. Of course, you want to create quantum, you know, uh, superposed data, and you want to do transmit that. That's the full quantum version. Uh, one of the big missing links for that is, uh, in the end, the transmission will be done by photons, uh, and typically it will be done by visible photons, not necessarily, but typically. Uh, but you have to convert a microwave photon to a visible photon, and, and, and with very high fidelity, because it's one photon. You, know, you can't lose it, right? Uh, and uh, this is, I think, a very interesting breakthrough, not from my group, but a collaborator, Hong Tang at Yale. Uh, what they used is aluminum nitride or gallium nitride-based materials, because these materials are semiconducting, but they're also very piezoelectric. So, so what happens is when a, when a microwave photon comes along, just the fact that the electric field can squeeze the crystal mechanically, right, it's a piezoelectric material, uh, uh, that you can use that as a nonlinear conversion mechanism to go from microwave to optics with almost 30% efficiency. 30%, out of 10 qubits, you are able to transmit three. That's not bad at all, I think. And then, the, and then from here on, you know, single photon transmission, that's very exciting. That's something we are uh, looking at. For example, we are using visible LEDs or lasers. Uh, you know, these are already in most of our uh, you know, lighting indoors or you know, um, in your cars, the headlights. These are all gallium nitride-based LEDs. And these are really quantum mechanically designed to emit light uh, with their very high efficiencies. You are injecting electrons and holes into quantum wells or quantum dots, and they combine, recombine and then they emit blue or green light, some results from our lab. 
uh, for structures we've grown. Uh, you can squeeze them and make them into quantum dots epitaxially. You can put them in pillars. And once you are in a ground state of a quantum dot, now it starts behaving like an artificial atom. You put in an electron in a hole, and it can only emit one photon at a time. So that's a standard sort of a, uh, it's very well known that a quantum dot is, uh, uh, or a single atom is the perfect quantum emitter. A quantum dot comes very close <laughs> right to it. There's another kind which is based on defects, you know, control defects, and that's something also feasible. So we are uh, trying to do that right now uh, uh, as part of a large project, uh, large as in you know few people uh, uh, involved in it. And uh, the base, basic idea is we already have the base structure. It's just a standard LED. You, you, you have to pump the uh, quantum dot uh, using that, and then you have to emit. What we'll get out here is visible light, but because there's a lot of light around us today, which is based on the same material platform, we can convert uh, life, uh, you know, this is the Li-Fi where you're transmitting data using LEDs. Uh, this is happening today. Instead of Wi-Fi, it's visible light or Li-Fi, light fidelity. Uh, we have to add uh, this support, which does, uh, you know, uh, which, which actually, uh, 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 implements the uh, the BB-8 or you know this this uh, BB-84 uh, paradigms for secure secure communications. Okay, so I'll end by saying that uh, some of the new materials that are being looked at here are uh, the standard quantum dot structure, but also things like hexagonal boron nitride. This has a very large band gap. It is also a nitride platform, so it can sit on the all the electronics and the optical platform I mentioned. Uh, so we are able to grow now these very rotationally aligned, high-quality boron nitride layers on top of very large, you know, large wafers. And when we start looking at their emission properties, I'm sorry, uh, we can see that it has, uh, it has this, uh, you know, anti-bunching effect, uh, which shows that it's a one photon being emitted at a time. Okay, so a uh, little bit over time, but I just wanted to end by saying that uh, quantum information systems. Uh, uh, there is quite a bit of reality in the communications part, uh, computation and memory. There are a lot of challenges, uh, some technological like computation, but some conceptual like memory. Uh, and new materials and devices definitely have a big role to play and maybe some might say central role because you may get unexpected things that theory did not predict. And finally, uh, quantum information systems, I feel, uh, have a lot to benefit by exploiting the huge uh, and very well-known things in classical computation system. A quantum computation system does not have to be completely different from a classical system. In fact, it can rest on the shoulders of, of a lot of things that have been developed and perfected and keep improving all the time. So, uh, okay, so with that, I'll uh, uh, end my talk, and if there are any questions, happy to take them. I noticed when you were showing your gallium nitride systems that they are grown on silicon carbide substrates and that the lattice match between silicon carbide and niobium nitride is pretty good, even better than the nitrides maybe That's on correct. the chart. That's so is correct. there any role for silicon carbide device technologies which are well developed in this kind of schemes? That's right. Uh, that's a great question. So uh, I think what uh, you asked is uh, the niobium nitride is even better matched to silicon carbide. And silicon carbide is currently uh, uh, actually very mature but for one application, and that is for power electronics. And power electronics is high voltage electronics, uh, so silicon carbide is much better matched. Uh, but silicon carbide, uh, we, we grow a lot on silicon carbide, we like it. The problem with silicon carbide is it cannot do RF. You know, RF is very high frequency, and uh, if you uh, want to make RF amplifier or microwave amplifier at, say, 40 or 50 or 60 gigahertz. Sorry? Um, well, okay, the, the mobility is 20, it cannot be high frequency. Uh, uh, the mobility of the MOSFET is very low. Uh, right, uh, yeah, I don't think there is a RF amplifier based on silicon carbide channels, but most of the RF amplifiers based on gallium nitride are built on silicon carbide, and that's because of the high thermal conductivity, you know, the heat dissipation part of it. Yes. 40 years ago, That's which right. they ultimately canceled. So I guess putting aside the 2D materials and also just focusing on classical computation, what has changed now? So that's a great question, because uh, has there been some scientific breakthrough that 
enable this change in paradigm? Uh, the answer is no. Actually, what happened, as far as I know, when I talk to the people, some people who are involved at IBM, the, big, the reason that DARPA and IBM shelved that project was because CMOS was just going, you know, yeah. they could project where it's going, right? Uh, in the early 90s is when they shelved it with Fujitsu competing and others, right? But uh, what changed now is the fact that computation is in data centers. That's really what happened. It's economical. Because computation moved out to data centers and you can't get m much below five nanometers in silicon. So there are two things that have happened at the same time. And it became economically feasible now, or it has become. So, yeah, gradual improvement in superconducting and silicon leveled out. Uh, and, and I think the more is more a logistic thing that because a lot of computation is being done cooling, at, yeah. with, in a place which can be cooled. So that's, I think, may, probably my way of justifying. Okay, good afternoon. Um, really excited to share with you some of the work that we do here at Pitt in the Nanoionics and Electronics Lab um, to cue the electronic failure. Okay, I'm just going to make sure all the connections are correct. Classical electronics. Okay. Um, so some of the work that we do in the nanoionics and electronics lab here at Pitt. Um, first, I'd like to start off just by um, describing to you uh, what it is that we do. So here's a slide that shows six different projects that we're actively working on. Um, the, the thing that combines or the thing that's uh, uh, common to all of them is they either involve polymers or ions or typically both. I'm trained as a polymer physicist. Um, and, and most of them involve using this technique called electrostatic um, double layer gating, electric double layer gating, um, where we use ions to induce charge in a semiconductor. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in the next slides. But as a polymer physicist, our contribution in this area is to do things like invent new electrolytes. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. Um, we use existing electrolytes um, to, do, uh, to uncover interesting physics in, say, two-dimensional crystals. Um, so that's another set of projects that we have. Um, and we're very interested in just understanding the fundamentals of this electrostatic double-layer gating technique, how fast these double layers form, how long they're retained, and how they we can for those. Um, <clears throat> this technique, before I get into the details, it's widely used. It's widely used not just for... 2D crystals, which seems to be the most popular area right now, but for regular uh, classical semiconductors. Um, it's also used in organic semiconductors. That's some of, some of the first papers I read were, were in uh, organic semiconductor devices. And this technique is powerful because it can induce these huge electric fields right at the interface of the material that you're trying to control the charge through. And, and we can see some really exciting and sometimes quantum phenomena um, come from that. So here's just four examples I pulled from recent literature um, on some exciting results uh, uncovering new, new physics and 2D materials. Um, today I'd like to focus on our efforts in developing new electrolytes, ones like we've never um, thought of before. But before I do that, um, I always give this um, introductory slide describing what exactly electric double layer gating is so we're all on the same page and poor DJ 
wherever he is, he's seen this slide like 12 times in the past decade. So here we go again. Um, so how does it work? This is the field effect transistor that DJ just walked you through, introduced you to, right? Where, where <coughs> uh, current's flowing from source to drain and we're modulating how much current flows through electrostatically using a gate. But what's different about this FET is that I've replaced the gate dielectric with an ion conducting dielectric. So it's still electrically insulating, but it has um, mobile anions and cations within it. And so if there's no gate bias applied, the ions are homogeneously distributed. But if we apply a negative gate bias, we could push anions to the surface of the semiconductor and do p-type doping. Um, and if you apply the opposite polarity bias, you could push cations to the surface and induce n-type doping. And the trick you're really doing here is the equivalent of taking the gate and pushing it down to within less than a nanometer of the surface. This creates a great, uh, really high uh, uh, field here. Um, and we know that the capacitance density goes inversely with this thickness of these two plates, if you will. And so you can get capacitance densities that are pretty large into the four uh, into the several microfarads per centimeter squared. And then if we look at the equation for the transistor, right, it's directly proportional to this oxide capacitance. So we could drive higher currents for the same voltage or only apply a smaller voltage um, to drive the same current. Um, so this technique's commonly used. So you put this stuff on top of your device and now you have this electrostatic gate that, that, that gives you access to regimes of transport that maybe you couldn't access with a classical uh, gate dielectric. But a few years ago, we had the idea, um, what if we scaled the electrolyte down to a single monolayer? Which feels pretty radical. So, so, so why don't we take this bulk stuff that you slather on top and instead, let's figure out how to get what we're calling a monolayer electrolyte. And if it's only a single monolayer thick, the idea is that the ions would either be located in this position, lowering the resistance of this channel, or they would be flipped up into the other position away from the surface of the channel, creating a high resistance state. So Alan Seaball and I, when I was back at Notre Dame, um, conceived of this idea. And we said, well, if we developed an electrolyte that works like this, it might be good for a type of non-volatile memory. So you could imagine a device structure that looks like this, where we pull the ions close to the surface, creating low resistance state, and we toggle them uh, away from that surface, creating a high resistance state. And what we liked about this is that this type of approach would not require um, any electrochemistry, like say resistive RAM, where you create and destroy conductive filaments, you typically uh, or can require a high, high voltage forming step. Um, we envision subvolt operation if you're able to tune the energy barrier here to this flipping. And we envision it to be fast. We know that ions move orders of magnitude more slowly than electrons and holes. But if you only ask them to move a monolayer uh, distance, they could do that on nanosecond timescales. Um, and we envisioned it, again, if we engineered whatever this monolayer electrolyte was going to be, if we, if we engineered it correctly, we envisioned this to be non-volatile, which means that once you set the state of the device, it stays there until you apply um, some voltage. And so at that time, when we dreamed this up, there was no such thing as a monolayer electrolyte. Um, and then I, don't, I didn't know how we would fabricate such a device um, with whatever type of ion conducting material we needed um, as its intermediate layer. So I sat down and thought about it and realized the, uh, uh, the ion conductor that we use for most of our other work is called polyethylene oxide. It's a CH2, CH2 um, oxygen repeat unit. And it turns out if you take a really short chain bit of polyethylene oxide and you covalently bind the ends together, you get this thing called a crown ether ring. And the crown ethers like to solvate metal ions. So if you look at a side profile, the ring's kind of flat. And you can imagine if you apply an electric field, um, you might be able to push the lithium ion to this surface, creating a low resistance or on state, and then apply e the opposite uh, field to push the ions away into the off state. And what I'm showing here isn't actually just a schematic. These are actually outputs from DFT calculations by our collaborators showing that when you apply these fields, that's in this paper, when you apply these fields, um, not only does the lithium respond to the field, but it sort of drags those ether oxygens along with it. You can see how the, the ring is kind of puckering um, in response to this electric field. And so if you um, consider from memory, turn the device on its side, 
we have two sort of like competing requirements, right? In memory, you want to set a state and have it stay there for a really long time, right? Like, like 10 years. Um, keep your pictures around for a while. And so the energy barrier to switching these two states would have to be high. Uh, but you also need to read, write the device quickly. So we need to be able to lower the barrier. And um, I don't have time to go into this with you, but our collaborators um, describe this adjustable barrier height. Um, it's adjusted by the, the, the strength of the applied field in this paper uh, published in 2017. And so this sort of gave us the theoretical um, uh, motivation to move forward with the experimental bit. Um, it turns out that crown ethers themselves don't like to lay flat on surfaces, but if you tether them to a big flat molecule like a thallocyanine, they do. And in fact, here's a cobalt crown ether thallocyanine. So there's four crown ethers, um, and you could pop four lithium ions into there. Um, uh, spin coated and annealed, or drop cast and annealed onto a, in this case, graphene surface. And these are STM images showing the individual molecules that self assemble, or I should say, order um, on that surface into an array. And then with STS, uh, STS uh, it was shown that the, um, the, the, the molecule is, is not electrically conducting, it indeed has a, has a band gap as we, as we would need um, for it to be ionic ionically conductive but electrically insulating. Um, so originally I, I showed you this structure, which was complicated and had stuff on top of it, and I don't know how to fabricate it. I, I don't even know if, if this electrolyte's going to show any bi-stability. Um, so we decided to start with this simplified backgated design. So imagine it. We're going to use the backgate to control the location of those ions. So, so the, the potential has to drop across this backgate oxide, then it has to penetrate through however many layers of whatever 2D crystal we use, and then it has to modulate the location of these ions. So what you're going to see is device characteristics that where we have to apply pretty high voltages, like tens of volts. Um, but we anticipate being able to bring that down uh, pretty significantly once we get this top gating uh, architecture figured out. Um, so the person who really pushed this project forward initially is Dr. Kaju, who who's, I'm fortunate to have as a member of my group for many years, and he's the co-executive director of PQI, and a big part of organizing um, this event. Um, and he said, OK, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to put this stuff down on a graphene transistor. And I'm going to use the Dirac point of graphene to monitor whether or not this new monolayer electrolyte stuff is doing any sort of doping. So first, I'm going to just scan without programming, um, doing a transfer measurement to figure out where the Dirac point's located. Um, and then I'm going to program it off. I'm going to push the ions away. Um, and, and I'm going to quickly make a transfer measurement. And the idea is that if the doping persists on the time scale of the measurement, then maybe we're seeing some bi-stability. If it just flops right back, uh, we won't see any shift in the Dirac point. Uh, and then after that, he programs it on, pulls it to the surface. And this work was published, um, it's now been a couple years ago in ACS Nano. Uh, but that's exactly what he saw. He was able to find the original location of the Dirac point, program it, um, uh, shift the Dirac point in one direction, shift it in another direction, and it maintained that doping uh, on the time scale of the, of the uh, measurement. And he did all the controls to show that this has nothing to do with gunk on the surface, or the, it actually is the coordination of these lithium ions um, and the crown ethers. And so we can estimate the sheet carrier density um, for this particular ion concentration we use, which was kind of low. We got up into the mid 10 to the 12s, just um, ball ballpark by the, the voltage shift. Um, and then that agrees pretty well with what we would expect based on the geometric packing from the STM measurements. Um, and if we load this up with lithium, we should be in the, the low to mid 10 to the 13s. And this is all just with the first shot at this material, right? There's a lot of things that we can engineer about the packing density and the chemistry of the molecule. Um, uh, Jerry Leong, a PhD student in my group here at Pitt, uh, started working on this project. And he said, well, we need a higher on-off ratio. We shouldn't be using graphene because it stinks in terms of, you know, it has no band gap. So the, di the, the resistance range is really small over which you could turn this thing off and on. So I'm going to use MOS2. And he was able to get um, the same sort of uh, by stability now as seen by the threshold voltage shift. Uh, but the problem was um, when he reads at zero volts, right? He has to read at a, at a voltage that's not going to disturb the state. Um, he has a terrible right, on-off ratio. So he said, OK, let's try a 2D crystal that's ambipolar. It has a threshold voltage of one of the branches that's close to zero. 
And so he started doing this work on more recently on WSE2. Um, <clears throat> this is the same sort of data again. Now we've shaded on and off. This orange area is what happens with this device. We're just backgating it. So we see again the same sort of shifting in the threshold voltage and the bias stability. Um, but we got to thinking, you know, the, the, the off state is just in vacuum, right? The lithium ions are pushed up. Um, it's just hanging out there in vacuum. In a real device, it needs some sort of uh, top gate dielectric. And so um, uh, 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 Jerry uh, packaged up the device and he walked it over to CMU. And in Ben Hunt's lab, he was able to do flake transfer of boron nitride in an inert environment directly on top of the, the, the monolayer electrolyte. And what he sees is a pretty um, significant stabilization of the off state that now at a zero read voltage is giving us um, on off ratios that are more exciting, like 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. So now the two states are quite distinguishable. And then he did what everyone would do uh, when you have some sort of device that looks like a memory. Um, he started doing um, endurance uh, measurements. Uh, before, before, we, before I get to that, um, I, I do I want to say that we also have DFT calculations to um, estimate for us how much the boron nitride is stabilizing our system. And the answer is it, it, it basically increases the absorption energy by about a little over an electron volt. So it certainly is more energetically favorable for the ion to be stabilized in the presence of that boron nitride. Um, these are the measurements I just mentioned, endurance and retention. I don't, I don't want to go too long into these just to say that he measured at least 1,000 cycles. And then for retention, he measured up to six hours. And you could see that whereas we start with an on-off ratio of maybe 10 to the 5 in this device, it does decay over time. And that's an interesting time constant. This is minutes, right? Um, so uh, I think we might have an idea chemically why that's happening, but there's a lot of parameter space here to explore in terms of custom synthesis of these materials, changing the crown size, changing the ion, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this is my last slide. Um, so uh, we also investigated the program erase voltages, right? Because there's some threshold voltage you have to apply in order to get this thing to switch. So he started way up here and he walked down until he couldn't switch anymore. And he noticed the threshold voltage at least backgated is around 12 volts. Um, I'm not really sure how to predict what this will be when we top gate it, but that's what we're actively working on now, getting a top gate down on that boron, boron nitride dielectric. And then speed is also important, right? If this thing switches on time scales of minutes, who cares? Um, so he started pulsing um, at progressively smaller pulse widths down to the limit of our instrument, which was about milliseconds. And he still sees two discern discernible states, but you'll notice that the on-off ratio has been lost um, kind of significantly. So again, um, we think we might have some sense of why that's happening. Um, and we have some new funding uh, from the NSF to explore down to nanoseconds and to try to understand what structure property relationships, right? How we can chemically tune this monolayer electrolyte to push that down into nanoseconds. Um, so with that, I'll just reiterate that we've developed this new type of monolayer electrolyte, kind of a radically different sort of electrolyte than we've seen before. It's dead easy to deposit. You drop cast it and spin coat it, um, at least on two-dimensional crystals. Um, I'm not sure how it drops on uh, other semiconductors. Um, we've shown that it's bistable on a bunch of these uh, materials and that this boron nitride cap is really important for increasing the on-off ratio. Um, and we still get switching down to flash relevant time scales of milliseconds. Um, the theory predicts fast switching. Um, that's going to require some new hardware in our lab, which we're working on. And then again, I'm excited to top gate this device um, to see what low voltages we can reach. Um, this was a collaboration between many people who I mentioned throughout the talk and who are listed here. And then the funding started off by, um, from the Semiconductor Research Corporation and DARPA, and then has been supported since then by two NSF grants. So with that, thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions if there's time here. <clears throat> yes. I'm wondering uh, if you, there are many different metal ions would be chelated with a crown ether, yeah. mm -hmm. and if you choose to have a higher charged mm -hmm. ion, would that be make it more efficient or more? You mean like uh, a divalent yeah, ion? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we could walk to column two of the periodic table. Um, and I, I think what some of the DFT calculations on these, met, these metal crown ether complexes show that you know, once you remove that second electron, now the ion complexes even more strongly with the crown. So what you've done there is increase the energy barrier to switching. And you might say like, oh, that sounds bad. But maybe it would be good to have a distribution of energy barriers, because then maybe you could think about multi-bit storage, right? Where you apply some voltage and you switch some, and you apply another voltage higher and you switch some more. And so this is way out there, but that's the type of barrier engineering I, I envision us doing, and now we have some more money to do the synthesis of those molecules. Any more questions? Hi. Just kind of a cookie one, but yeah, I love if it. you, um, before you put the capping layer on, when you have the column more exposed, yeah. uh, is it possible to put a big enough voltage on that the lithium actually leaves? Oh, like discharge you know, shoot the lithium. It out, yeah, it kind of just um, it I don't know. associates because you, there's no, you eliminate the barriers. Because there's no, yeah, I don't know. That's cool. How would I detect that? No, what, your effect would go away. Yeah, the effect would go away. <laughs> would go yeah, away. I'm, I'm thinking the carbon stuff, the carbon, the carbonaceous part would break down, maybe before that happens. But I don't know. It's like ions going. Ions are on top and outside. Yeah. So I think maybe they're not very tightly know. bound and yeah. actually leave. That's pretty cool. I don't know. It is a kooky idea. I like it. <laughs> if they ever if it goes bad. <laughs> Yeah, Joycey. When you, uh, when you drop caster, do you get a uniform coverage if it's like a monolayer? Yeah, so Joycey just asked, um, when we drop cast, do we get uniform coverage? So um, Jerry has painstakingly uh, optimized this process. So he drop casts, and then um, he has to drop, you know, he has to do the calculation to drop cast just the right amount to get uniform coverage. And you can sometimes see regions where it's really distributed, and then maybe along grain boundaries, there's some buildup. But in those, like, planes, it's pretty uniform. Okay. Um, so we, we have it optimized like locally, right? But like on a giant wafer, and, you know, we're, we're far away from that. But I think it could be done, maybe it could be deposited in a different way, like by someone who knows what they're doing in terms of deposition of large molecules. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
No, you know what? I lost my All right, everybody, uh, let's get ready to start with the next session. Uh, so our next uh, speaker is Professor Gustavo Scuseria, who's going to talk about quantum chemistry for strong correlation. And um, you kind of saw this, um, you, you know, may, maybe uh, it came out of my, my previous talk. You know, in a sense, the question of dynamic correlation and locality and electronic structure has been a theme for, for quite a while. And in a sense, dynamic ele uh, uh, electron correlation is, is um, kind of the easy kind of uh, question, you know, there's uh, spatial dependence uh, that one can often exploit in order, to re, uh, in order to formulate very efficient algorithms. But where things get really, really complicated is, you know, when we have near degenerate electronic uh, states, for example, when we have entanglement and we have strong correlation. In those cases, one needs really, really uh, new approaches uh, because there's no easy, um, say, Distance dependence. These are very long. Can be very long-range interactions that require many, uh, for example, states to interact. And so, I, uh, you know, uh, one of the leading groups is that of Professor Scuseria in, in, in this area of inventing, um, you know, really new uh, and uh, and um, creative new ways for for tackling strong correlation. So, I very much look forward uh, to to this exciting talk. So, let's give a hand to Professor Scuseria. Now it's too low. Is that okay? Okay, so I don't have to. Can you lower the volume a little bit? Because other one, otherwise everyone is gonna be. Okay, so um, I know this is a kind of an eclectic audience, so I started with a very big picture slide trying to explain what we're trying to do. Um, what we're trying to do is to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation with von Oppenheimer um, for molecules and materials. You know, we know the equation has a, it's a linear equation. The problem is the dimensionality. It's a huge dimension. So what does solve mean in this context? Means finding an accurate polynomial cost approximation as a function of system size. You know, we know we how to deal with small systems. Um, one problem is how to deal with a large system. Now, people are talking about, you know, I'm, I'm gonna talk about deterministic um, approaches only, but there are other approaches, stochastic approaches, Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo, uh, quantum simulators, we heard quite a bit about quantum computing. I'm talking about the first today only. Now, there are some good news in solving this problem, and that is that uh, the weak correlation problem has been solved via couple cluster theory. You probably have heard about it. I want to say a few words, not much. And sometimes, you know, Martin talk about the FT, and the FT is a lot faster than couple cluster, but there's been substantial progress also in making couple cluster faster. I don't see that as a fundamental obstacle. The bad news is that when the interaction, the two body part of a Hamiltonian is much larger than the one body part, uh, I say that loosely here as H2, uh, much larger than H1, uh, that's the regime of strong correlation where the physics is determined by the interaction. And this is the regime where couple cluster fails. I'm gonna show you some examples about this. So I would posit that strong correlation is an open problem. And, and the question is whether there's a solution. Is there a way to model with our brains, all right, come up with an answer that will take care of the low energy states in this combinatorially ex ex exploding Hilbert space. So for the weak correlation case, when H2 is much smaller than H1, perturbation theory works, we can do Hartree-Fock as a good approximation, we can do MP2, we can do many things. 
Okay, so I will um, make here a few bullets about my talk. I want to talk about strong correlation and the connection with symmetry and degeneracy. Then understanding why couple cluster fails under strong correlation. I'll bring up the importance of symmetry breaking and restoration for strong correlation. And then I will discuss briefly, not too many equations and, and some results, two solutions that merge symmetry breaking and restoration with couple cluster. And there's going to be an interlude for Martin on, on strong correlation symphony. <laughs> this was not planned, by the way. <laughs> So, uh, I started my career in a couple of classrooms, by the way. Uh, in, in 94, we wrote a, a, a review article with Tim Lee, and those I called the early days of optimism because we didn't know what strong correlation was. We knew that the orbitals were tough, but we haven't seen the beast in, in all its, it, it, it's a full magnitude. And this article discusses how large basis set, CCSE parenthesis T, gets the right answer for the right reason for the things that quantum chemists care about, which is equilibrium ball necks, vibrational frequencies, and things like that. And this is how sometimes this is referred as the gold standard. And as Martin said, uh, this applies to main group chemistry. The top of a periodic table, maybe 95% of chemistry, it's done, if you do this uh, type of calculation, you will get the right answer for the right reason. I'm interested in the other 5% when things are strongly correlated. So to make some of my points, I'm gonna use two model Hamiltonians, okay? and they are the Hubbard model, the repulsive Hubbard model, and another model called attractive pairing, um, which essentially is a model where pairs attract each other. And these are electronic, they're fermionic, what is good about them is I have a single parameter uh, that determines the correlation regime, so I can tune when I'm weakly correlated, when I'm strongly correlated very, very easily. And as I said before, when u over t is large or g over delta epsilon is large, I'm strongly correlated. And why do we study this? Well, because first it's easy. We're trying ideas, we're, we have many ideas, and then we try them on this Hamiltonian, and if they don't work, we just throw them away, okay? Uh, um, the, the reason to say that is because if we cannot solve these Hamiltonians with a deterministic polynomial cost ansatz, there is little hope to ever deal with the long-range Coulomb potential. There is no long-range Coulomb here. It's on site here. Well, there's no Coulomb at all in this one. So, so there is very little hope to deal with the long-range Coulomb of real molecules and materials that contain, in many cases, hundreds of electrons. Okay? So, that's the reason why I focus on this. All right, so let me show you results for uh, this model Hamiltonians for restricted couple cluster. Restricted here means that it's done over a symmetry adapter Slater determinant. I will discuss later what happens when we allow symmetries to break, and these problems don't appear, but other problems do appear. And what we see is here is energy as, in, as a function of this interaction strength parameter, so this is weak correlation, strong correlation. In red is restricted hartree fock In black is the exact answer. This model Hamiltonians, we can actually integrate them and, and solve them exactly. But we, don't, we wanna use something that allow us to solve these Hamiltonians and other Hamiltonians, which are in the phase diagram around, but we can use the same polynomial cost tool everywhere, not at these points of integrability if you want. Uh, which is Bethe answers, by the way. Um, so, in both cases, couple cluster goes really bad. Here, the solutions become complex. The correlation energy uh, is imaginary. That doesn't make any sense. And what you see is a complete breakdown of the theory. And it happens not arbitrarily at any point. It happens very near the point where symmetries break, which is here roughly U4 in this case. And here, I'm actually plotting in terms of G over G critical, so it means, it means that pass one, uh, number symmetry will break spontaneously if I allow it. Adding more excitations doesn't solve the problem, okay? I wanna show you that in the next slide. Uh, you, if you do all excitations, of course, then you get the right answer, but you're doing exact diagonalization, full CI at that point. So for many, for, for quite some time, we thought that if we understood why couple cluster fails in these cases, we should be able to fix it. And this is, sort of uh, uh, the diagnosis of what happens with couple cluster. Um, it's, what we do is we do full CI and we reverse engineer it into full couple cluster so we can look at the 
wave function, and these are plots of log log plots of uh, um, the size of the cluster amplitudes for doubles, triples, quadruples, all the way to 10 tuples, and here to, to order 12 as a function of interaction strength again. So what you see here on the left, weak correlation, doubles are bigger than triples, that are bigger than quadruples. That's the regime of, uh, of weak correlation. That's the perturbative regime that we know how to deal with. At some point, things revert. And in the strongly correlated uh, uh, K situation, you see gigantic amplitudes. For example, here, uh, T12, which is the excitations of all pairs, is a collective excitation of all, the connected part of that is 10,000. Something is deeply wrong. And just to make the point, when we truncate coupled cluster, okay, to decouple the equations, so it's not, the cost is not combinatorial, we have to decouple the equations, uh, we make an approximation which it says, well, we're going to consider up to doubles or triples and neglect the rest. Neglect the cumulants. We neglect the connected excitations. We keep, of course, all of the products of the lower order excitations in this exponential parameterization. What happens in strong correlation is collective excitations are important. It's not singles and doubles that determine the physics. There are excitations of all the fermions, okay, and those are very, very difficult to, uh, to model. And of course, full CI, everything is fine. Um, I make this plot, uh, people say, well, what happens with the full CI wave function? What happens under strong correlation in this model systems is that all determinants have equal weight. The weight here is one, because I, I am in intermediate normalization. That means that this is the maximum possible entanglement entropy that you can have. When every state in the Hilbert space has the same weight, you know, everything is fully entangled. All right, so why is symmetry important? Because symmetry implies degeneracy and factorization. I emphasize factorization. We learn this in physical chemistry, and then we forget about it. When, when we do the hydrogen atom, we know that the wave function factorizes, and the levels are degenerate. Why? Because we have spherical symmetry. Okay. Now, in electronic structure, the Hamiltonian is so much complicated that it's very difficult to, to figure out, okay, what are the factorizations that I need to use? But the symmetries of the Hamiltonian impose some factorizations of the wave function. And not all symmetries are exact in the sense that they are operators that commute with Hamiltonian. We can have quasi-symmetries or dynamical symmetries, operators that quasi-commute. They will create degenerate manifolds too. Not exactly degenerate, but nearly degenerate. So Daniel used the word nearly degenerate. That's as complicated as exactly degenerate. Now factorization of high order excitation amplitudes in terms of the lower order ones is the promising route for obtaining polynomial cost wave function method. That's what coupled cluster says. Coupled cluster says your quadruples are, some are important and some are not important. The ones that are important are products of doubles. And the, the coefficient is one half, is the exponential, okay? And how it turns out that this is wrong under strong correlation. It's very good, excellent under weak correlation. But under strong correlation, the collective excitations, if we look from the world of doubles, the collective excitations factorize into lower excitations, they renormalize the coefficient of the doubles, which is not one half. It is one half when you can neglect the connected pieces that are higher. Okay, so this is renormalization at work. And I will posit that spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay, in Hartree Fock, flag strong correlation which sometimes we refer as symmetry dilemma in molecules because you have to choose between having good quantum numbers and a bad energy or bad quantum numbers and a good energy. It's another example of conservation of the, the, of the principle of misery, if you want. So the uh, first solution is sort of bread and butter quantum chemistry. Well, let's improve the reference, not hard fog, use something better Okay, and let this reference carry strong static correlation. And then let's have a couple cluster take care of the rest. So this first sort of idea, it's bread and butter quantum chemistry with a caveat that I'm going to use as multi-reference symmetry projector Hartree-Fock. 
I'm not going to pick my determinants. I'm going to let the symmetries break. I'm going to restore the symmetries and declare that symmetry restoration brings the collective excitations and important determinants that I must have in the reference wave function. It's a very simple idea, but in practice, you'll see why it's complicated. So without going into the details, spin projector hard fog is something that we have developed. You know, it was initiated by Levdin in the 50s. Many people work on this. It was abandoned. Uh, you know, we resuscitated uh, some years ago and wrote code and a whole bunch of things. The important conceptual aspect of restoring symmetries is that it's a non-orthogonal configuration interaction. This brings collective excitation, all right, which are very difficult to describe otherwise. Requires some numerical integration, but the cost is still hard refug. And I'm going to show you results with two methods. One is spin project and understated hard refug, and the other one is spin project that generalized hard refug, where both a square and a C are restored. And two flavors just project the broken symmetry, which we, didn't, we don't do. And what we do is project and optimize at the same time the broken spin symmetry or the broken symmetry uh, determinant. That's much better, smooth curves, no kinks. This is very complicated, very not satisfactory. All right, and this is okay. Now projecting uh, a square on, on UHF, that's restricted hardware fog. This is restricted couple cluster. Black is exact. UHF, yeah, not bad energy, but bad quantum numbers. SUHF, better energy and correct quantum numbers. Hmm? Are we exact? No, we're not. We're still now missing weak correlations, and this is where you say, ah, what we do is CCSD on top of SUHF, and we're done. Right? It's obvious. I mean, we're missing dynamical correlation here. Okay, so let me go to the Fullerins and present this interlude. <laughs> where we study fullerenes with symmetry projector hard refugs. So we, we wrote this paper in 2014 uh, with Carlos Jimenez Hoyos. He's now a professor at, well, um, at Wesleyan, and uh, discussed the bullet radical character and spin frustration in fullerene molecule. Um, what was happening, it's a long story, but I'm going to just say a few things only. Why do we believe that these guys are strongly correlated? Because it turns out in our view that what makes network uh, of bonds, of carbon bonds, happy is short range uh, antiferromagnetic spin spin interaction. Like in graphene, for example. Uh, when you put a pentagon there, you, you produce frustration. You cannot just go around up, down, up, down, up, down. When you start doing that, ah, you, don't, you mismatch. Okay? So there's geometric frustration because of the pentagons, and that we believe causes issues. And this was highlighted, Martin mentioned this, the fact that if you do an RHF calculation on, on, on C60 and you optimize the cage, you get an icosahedral ball. Perfect. But somebody in Martin's group does the Hessian and finds out that that thing is unstable. If you allow the spins to be up and down and break spatial symmetry and break spin symmetry, they do that and the energy goes way down. The problem is now we reoptimize the, the cage and it's non icosahedral. So something is very wrong because there is, there is one thing we know about C60 is that the NMR has a single peak, which means that all the carbon atoms are equivalent, so it is icosahedral. Well, it turns out, this is what Carlos finds out, that there is a UHF to GHF where the, where the orbitals now become non collinear and complex, and that also lowers the energy. And when you re-optimize the cage, now all of the carbon atoms are uh, equivalent by point group. Now, if you do spin projection at any level, you always get that the cage is icosahedral. Okay? But broken symmetry mean field at the GHF level also says the same thing. Now, something very important happens here because the homoluma gap of C60 is huge, seven electron volts. And if you do UHF, actually, the gap gets even bigger. It's nine electron volts. So how can we have symmetry breaking with such a large homolumbo gap? Well, Coulomb and exchange are even bigger, exchange in particular. All right, so this is the physics of a non-insulator, a very large gap, but short range antiferromagnetic interactions that are doing the strong correlation. And we know that C60, if we dope it, with electrons or with holes, it becomes superconducting, which is the same physics as the cuprates in that sense. 
and I put here some numbers. We actually, in, in that paper with Carlos, we, um, we more or less decided that the, the U, Harvard U for C6 is 3.3 uh, in T units. Um, and if you look at the single triplet gap, it's 1.7 electron volts. This is experimental. So this is a huge red flag. Look at the Homolumo gap and look at the experiment. So a non, an uncorrelated picture is going to be wrong. Because see, the experiments tell you that the gap is much smaller. And if you, if you derive a J Heisenberg from this data, you get 1 EB, and you see 1 EB J with, uh, with this 1.7 means trouble. Okay? I guess the difference with what Martin and, and Jung Ho are saying, they say C6 is not strongly correlated. I, I say, no, it is strongly correlated. It's a strong correlation with a large gap, which is different from strong correlation when the gap closes. That's the one that the chemists are used to, when the gap closes and then symmetries break. But symmetries break with large gaps when you have other types of interactions that are, are important. And when you look at the magnetization in GHF, uh, it's highly non-collinear. Uh, it's the same on every atom. Um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 this is what we call significant polyradical character. And this is a smoking gun of why uh, uh, when you look at the spin-spin correlation, nearest neighbors with RHF, you get this picture, and then the 2PDM in, in hard fog, it's just factorizing the 1RDM, so you get nearest neighbor spin-spin correlations and nothing else. When you do the spin-projected GHF, okay, which is a fully symmetry-adapted wave function, you see huge, but very large spin-spin correlations. This is a Schlegel diagram. So there's the pentagon here, which is close or far away from me, and this is the other pentagon. So from this big red uh, uh, dot to that, that's two extremes of the fullerene cage. What you see here are very large spin-spin correlations. They are not mean field, because otherwise, they're, they, no, it's mean uh, symmetry projected. And this is, for us, a strong correlation. That's one way to define strong correlation, when you have very long range uh, uh, Spin spin correlations, for example. They could be of other, other, other nature. All right, let me go back to, um, to novel methods. So I, I made it all the way to the end. So we were saying SUHF restores quantum numbers, but I'm missing now uh, dynamical short range correlation, weak correlations. So what we do is this is the SUHF energy. What we do is we come with the exponential of couple cluster here, here. This is the residual. And the spin projected wave function, I didn't say much about it, but it implies an integral over rotated slater determinants, uh, which are non orthogonal to each other. And that's what the spin projection is. It's integrating over the coherent states associated with the symmetry, with the Lie group of the symmetry. Now, Technical issues, for those of you that know couple cluster, one thing good about couple cluster is that this similarity transform Hamiltonian truncates very quickly at the second commutator. But if you do it on something that has a weight in the entire Hilbert space, then you need the, uh, the eight particle RDM, which is pretty scary. Uh, the, there is some good news, it's an eight RDM at each grid point, but it factorizes like a hard refog. But still, eight factorial is a big number. There are lots and lots of terms. So this theory, we, we had it in mind for many, many years, but we never implemented it until this guy, Drudge, uh, helped us, which is an algebraic manipulator. So we have two guys, Drudge makes all the algebra, and Grismill does the Fortran. And they don't make errors. You have to be careful to put the input correctly and then you know, not, not be too stupid. We still need humans to clean things up. But this is just you know, emphasize the point that the algebra is very complicated. At the end, the equations are not so complicated, but deriving this is really not simple. That's why we never did it until just a few a year ago or so. And now what we see here, Hubbard again, um, my benchmark case, two by six quarter filling, um, that's SUHF. And when I do couple cluster on top, only doubles, I have periodic boundary conditions, singles don't contribute. I gain much of the energy, but I'm still missing quite a bit. Okay? So, so uh, there is more to the story than just CCD on SUHF being the right answer. This is just to show that it's not the right answer, because the dope Hubbard model is actually something that has all kinds of very long range, strange correlations, density, density, spin, spin, and things like that. 
And there's a caveat about this theory. And the caveat is I'm using particles and holes of restricted heart refuge, not of SUHF. Well, the question is, does SUHF have its own particles and holes? That's sort of a question that we're investigating. The, I know this is for, for more, it's too technical maybe for this audience, but, but there are caveats about what we're doing here. So this, that brings me to possible solution two, which is, look, if the symmetries want to break, just let them break. Let, and then do a couple classes on top. We, we quantum chemists have been doing that for many years, but we have good, bad quantum numbers in that case. And then all properties other than the energy are suspect. Okay, so then the idea is, let symmetries break, do a couple cluster, and then restore the symmetries. You told me you know how to restore symmetries in mean field. Well, you should be smart enough to restore symmetries after you do a couple cluster. I am not, but my students are, <laughs> or one of them. And um, so it's still challenging. I want to say why. There is a fundamental cultural and language barrier between couple cluster, which is the language of particles and holes, and everything is orthogonal to everything. And the language of spin projection or any symmetry projection, which is rotating things, becoming non-orthogonal, and then integrating, and then this is how you get the collective excitations at mean field cost. You get some of that. So, to make a long story short, details are in this paper. Well, what we did is we express the rotation operator of symmetry projection in couple cluster language. And what you get is a constant, singles, doubles, triples at each and every beta point. These beta points you have to integrate. This is the, the grid, if you want, in the, uh, in the spin. In, it's this grid here. Okay, it's, it's the gauge symmetry, and we are integrating over the group here, too. But anyway, so um, what you get is uh, uh, a couple cluster uh, calculation that is modified, and then you have to evolve this single doubles and triples over a grid, which ha you have to do an integration, uh, differential integration, differential equation integration, but it's very simple. It's just Runge Kuda, one dimension. It works. And, sorry, so... Again, back to one of my examples, 10 by 1 Hubbard, 10 electrons, RHF, restricted couple cluster, okay, here. Uh, yellow is UHF, mean field broken symmetry. Blue is spin projected UHF, I showed you that earlier, and I was saying I'm missing that. Okay, in red, that's UCCSD, okay, it's much closer to the right answer, and bad quantum numbers. When we do the spin projection, bingo. I mean, the agreement is so good that I have another slide, a blow up, uh, to show that for sizes up to 26 um, sites, 26 orbitals, that's in blue here. So the UCCSD results are up here, different sizes. It's converging to the thermodynamic limit. You see that, 26. This model is 1D Hubbard. You're roughly in the thermodynamic limit, uh, and it has converged. The errors are of the order between 1% and 2%. Not bad, but not good enough for what quantum chemists wants. And then when you do the spin projection, and this is done variation after projection, which means that it's not just a single shot that you do UCCSD and you project. No, you do UCCSD in the presence of the projection operators that are also affecting the singles and doubles. It's explained in this paper. And now the errors here are, you know, way below... 1%. So that's very reconforting. All right, so now the other Hamiltonian I haven't talked about is the pairing Hamiltonian. And uh, it's a different beast because the pairs attract. Coulomb propulsion is fundamental in electronic structure. And why would you care about a Hamiltonian that the pairs attract? Well, that's phonon-mediated superconductivity, if you want. You, you, I will get to that point in a second. But this is to show that for this Hamiltonian, the exact answer here in this plot is 1. It's energy as a function of interaction strength, again. And couple cluster is almost exact until, vroom, it blows up. Same, same type of failure as we've seen in the other plots. Here is ratio of energies. That's why it shoots up. And here is uh, projected BCS, which is number projected broken symmetry mean field. Because the, the, the symmetry that breaks this number, the, uh, the mean field theory is called BCS, or hartree bogle yubov we number project that. We can also do a couple cluster in the broken symmetry land, and that is this BCS CCD, 
which is this curve here. It doesn't blow up, okay? It, but, but, but it's not the right answer either. Um, and it looks interesting that projected BCS, like SUHF, is not accurate, but it's correct everywhere. Okay? So then this brings the point, uh, why don't we do the same thing we did in, this, in the spin case for the repulsive Hamiltonian? Let's do number projected, broken symmetry couple cluster, and see what we get. And what we get, again, is very, very, very accurate. Um, it's there in yellow. Um, different flavors, singles and doubles, single doubles and triples. Uh, number projection vastly improves uh, BCS CCD. So this is good for us because it now looks like a sort of a universal recipe. It works for repulsive systems where spin breaks. It works for attractive systems where number breaks. But I'm not doing nuclear structure theory. My friends are, my, my nuclear physicist friends are, and we publish with them, uh, Thomas Dugueris and in Saclay in France. Uh, but electronic structure is not about nucleons attracting each other. So why do we care about this? Okay, so, by the way, repulsive Hamiltonians don't break number symmetry in mean field. But the reason I care about this, and you're going to hear this message from me many, many times, is because under strong correlation, electron pairs attract each other. They start attracting each other, and they want to condense. That's something that we have not uh, expressed clearly, and it's data in this paper supporting that sort of conjecture. It's in a 2D repulsive hover model, and we say how we describe how broken pair excitations influence the exact pair wave function. Let me, let me explain that to you. So what is the exact pair wave function? The exact pair wave function, we need to distinguish between two things. One thing is we have a Hamiltonian that breaks pairs. Our Hamiltonian does not conserve this thing called seniority. So it breaks the pairs. So we can do a full CI where we only consider excitations from, say, RHF, some, some Slater determinant. And these excitations don't break the pairs. Okay? That's called the OCI. It's a full CI of pair excitation. But that wave function is, in principle, different from, let's do the full CI of all excitations, pairs broken and pairs not broken. And then, when we're done, we look at, this, at the pair sector of that guy. Okay, so it turns out that under weak correlation, these two things are the same. The broken pair excitations don't affect the full CI of pairs. Full CI, and the full CI of pairs, by the way, is very well approximated by pair CCD, which is a mean field cost method. It just is couple cluster only for pairs. Under strong correlation, that is not true. There is very large changes in the the full CI is zero, which is the paired sector of the full CI, which means that broken pair excitations are renormalizing the pair wave function, the exact pair wave function. And when you look at what is this wave function, how does it look like if it is not paired CCD? Well, it turns out that it requires a large character of projected BCS, which means that a, a wave function that is number projecting the broken symmetry meaning field is capturing the most important correlation. So to summarize, um, let me just tell you that the combination of symmetry restoration and couple cluster shows promise for modeling strong correlation. A picture of the group and NSF, DOE, Welch, and Gaussian that support my research. And thank you all for your attention. Great. Thanks for this nice talk. Are there any questions? Yes, Martin. Put your mic closer. The first point is um, uh, you haven't really addressed the question of artificial versus essential symmetry breaking in C60 um, and how that might or might not be different from, say, C36, where there are similar CGHF solutions. So, um, so that's the first point. Can I answer that uh, and then we well, can check? Perhaps I should give you the three points and then we'll <laughs> Then go. I will forget the first. Uh, okay, I'll remind you. Um, the second point is that um, if indeed C60 is polyradicaloid, it must show up in the one PDM of a method that includes um, electron correlation properly. 
We did um, CCSD with restricted orbitals and also CCVBSD, which is a method capable of treating some classes of strong correlation. And we found on the order of um, um, 0.15 of an electron unpaired per carbon atom, which is consistent with closed shell character. And then, the th uh, and so, and so that's a, a second issue to speak to. And the third issue is the um, difference between the homo, the big homo lumo gap, and the small singlet triplet gap, speaks to me to the different molecular physics of electron attachment and detachment, i.e., homo ionization lumo EA versus some um, promotion, which is the singlet triplet gap. So there is another explanation there as well. Okay, so the first one, um, I didn't talk about artificial symmetry breaking or essential symmetry breaking because I don't see a difference between them except from the perspective that one happens, uh, it appears that what you call essential symmetry breaking is symmetry breaking associated with a gap that is closed, and a hard to fall gap that is closed. Okay? And the other one is, is a gap that is not closing, like in C60. Okay, for me, I translate the second one as mod physics insulator, and, and you know, I, I want to be on the side of the uh, condensed matter physicists. If you tell them a mod insulator is not strongly correlated, it's just, they will start laughing. And, um, and so C36 is, is a radical. We agree on that, okay? And, uh, and you say it's strongly correlated. And C60 is less strongly correlated. My effective U is 3.3. Is, is is, is, it's in the recoupling region, if you want. I would like to say it's still strongly correlated, but it's sort of in the recoupling region. And experimentally, you know, my friends tell me, you know, in the early days, C60 was discovered at, at Dreis, and then when we was preparing microscopic quantities, all of my colleagues, they were doing all these experiments, and I'm, you know, I'm a physicist by training, but I became a theoretical chemist, and I will say, you know, tell me about it, tell me about it, and they will say, it's not automatic, that's for sure, we know that, but it's like, a, you know, it reacts like a deficient alkene. So it, it's not polyradical in the polyradical sense, but it has, it's a very reactive molecule. It sucks in electrons. So I think it fits this picture that maybe you don't want it to be strongly correlated, I will say, is among the strongly correlated you know, molecules I can think of, maybe it's on the re more on the recoupling side than, than some of the others. And as I, I, as I told you, I was going to forget about the second, the, the second or third point. What's the second point? Um, well, that's, you know, you, you, you've seen our papers on the polyacenes. So in the polyacenes, you see, you have just plots. You know, so that's, again, you know, we see this, and then they start coming in and stops. So that, that is sort of this intermediate regime where you cannot say that is uh, 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 weakly correlated. But I guess the, the point maybe where, where we can agree is that you see this is a very interesting wave function. So think of this as a wave function. See, this is what hard fog gives you. So if this is the exact spin-spin uh, uh, correlator, you see that it has a very, very large uh, 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 component on RHF. In that sense, coupled cluster doesn't blow up, by the way. A year ago, you asked me, does it blow up? And, and you were right, it doesn't blow up. But it's not the right answer either. Because to get these correlators right, you need collective excitations that are brought in by, by the spin projection. So in other words, I will pause it, and we should do the calculations. For me, it was self-evident, so I never bothered to do it. But now, I read your paper, so my students are doing the calculations. I want to put, yeah, I want to, there are two issues here. Does couple cluster agree with SGHF on this correlator? That's a very good point. And the second point is, well, what is the right answer? Because if, you know, that's, we don't know. But at least it will be interesting. I put my money that CCSD does not agree with this. It's going to exponentially decay the correlator much, much faster than, than what SGHF does. No, no, actually softening is one of the points here. So GHF, always mean feel, exaggerates the correlations. And, there, when, when, and, and then when we restore symmetry, we see that there's a softening. Uh, we haven't seen an enhancement ever. Um, and the third one? Oh, okay, so that's... Um, 
No, I mean, I, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I guess the, the important point there, here is is that then, then, then you know, for for a long time, maybe this is very biased against my own ignorance. For a long time, I thought that unless you have, if you have a large gap, you could not be strongly correlated. And then I learned what mon insulators are and understood that physics. And 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 when I see a large homo luma gap, it's like, well, you know, I'm not going to be strongly correlated. But when I see a small singlet triplet gap. You know, that's sort of a different part of my brain that says, oh, okay, so maybe you can be strongly correlated. Because, you know, that means that, you know, the, the, the Heisenberg interaction, so roughly 2J is a single triplet gap, right? So, so any, anytime you see a J of one electron volt, you will say, well, you know, this is, this is fairly sizable. And if the experimental single triplet gap is 1.7, you know, that sort of makes sense. So. Uh. Gus, very nice. I just wanted to comment on the discussion there. If you take the experimental IP and the experimental EA, the single particle gap is 3.1 EV. Yeah, so the, the, the ionization potential of uh, C60 is 7, 7 EV, the electron affinity is 2.5? I think they're off a, a little bit than that. Uh, but the gap is much smaller than what you're listing. That's because so, so you're that, using that will be the, uh, the single particle gap it's yes. down around three, three and a half EV. Yeah. This is so large because you're using a 631G basis set. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but this is uncorrelated. So, so, and you're, you're talking about the IP and electron affinity. The experimental values. Experimental values. Right. If you do the, uh, the hard fog values, I don't know what you get. But you should get something that is of this order. Uh, so I, I have some questions. Um, very intrigued by... Uh, your focus on these uh, pairing models. And I guess one is maybe a ph philosophical question, like are you interested in those class of models because you're interested in uh, you know, understanding generally or having a model where you can compare exact methods with uh, your approximate methods or are you actually interested in attractive models and if so, what are the physical systems? And the other question, <laughs> I have a lot of questions. Um, but the, when you l looked at the, the form of the pairing, you, you had it was a P, uh, S wave pairing, and I was wondering why you chose that, uh, and you know, as opposed to say P wave pairing. Well, okay, so so this is Richardson Godin integrable, and so this is a model of SU two rational model singlet pairing, but but the same type of things we can do, uh, and have exact solutions for for P wave and P. P plus IP and a whole bunch of other things. Um, this, is, this is the bullet that uh, I want to say again. The point is we, we have many ideas, we try many methods, we want them to be polynomial costs. And we have this, uh, we made this decision that if we cannot make them work in these two systems, then we just don't, don't push them anymore. Because we believe that these two points of integrability uh, which this, you know, these two guys are Bethian's as integrable. So, but if you go away from, from, from certain parameters which are not explained clearly here, then you cannot integrate anymore. So what I want is a polynomial cost tool as the ones that I have described that I can do for hundreds of, of electrons or hundreds of pairs, and then I'm, I'm gonna test them at this point, then I'm gonna move away and use them in any other system that is non-integrable. Uh, it's a very convoluted answer, okay, but, but that's what it is. So it's, it's somehow fine. I mean, if you look at, well, let me, let me stop there. Yeah, are we interested in the systems per se? No. But I posit, you know, that attractive pairing, that it's important to solve, to solve that attractive pairing Hamiltonian because what I said at the very end, it turns out that under strong correlation, when you look at full CI, whatever you can look, people have not done this. That, that was a 16 by 16 to the hover lattice. Dope, when you look at the pair wave function in the exact full CI, it's totally different from if you let the pairs interact with themselves that if you let them interact with broken pairs. This is a w fancy way or a very convoluted way of saying what physicists say, that spin fluctuations drive the Cooper pair formation in a, in a repulsive system. And, and this Hamiltonian you know, has, is attractive but if you cannot do this, which is a simple, traditional, phonon-mediated superconductor, good luck with the, with the other one. So this is like, you know, this is something you have to do. So when people come in quantum chemistry with new methods, I tell them, well, show me that it works for Hubbard and it works for attractive pairing. And many of the things that people are now pushing, they fail badly, badly here. They're not going to deal 
with the real physics of strongly correlated systems, we, we, they are repulsive if you cannot do this. That's, that's my take. All right. With that, let's uh, thank Professor Scusieria again. Thank you.